It's uh, three o'clock on Wednesday. Good afternoon and welcome to the Gaming in Holland webinar, VAT rules for ne Netherlands licensed operators and service providers. And welcome. I believe we have just over 100 people registered for today, so welcome from wherever you log in. In the Netherlands, gambling services are not subject to VAT, but rather to a wholly separate gambling tax. As a result, operators are unable to deduct the VAT charged by their suppliers from their own tax liability. This means, in effect, that third-party products and services, including marketing, could potentially end up being 21% more expensive. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the relevant tax regulations as well as practical solutions for minimizing the impact of the Dutch VAT rules on licensed gambling operators and their suppliers. Before we kick off with today's webinar, I would like to thank our strategic partners and sponsors. Without your, their invaluable support, we will not be able to do this. Thank you very much. Also, before we start, as always, our webinars are interactive. If you would like our speakers to answer one or more of your questions, please submit them through the Slido app. At the end of this webinar, there will be time to answer audience questions. If you would like to submit a question or upvote somebody else's, Please scan the QR code here on your screen or visit slido.com and enter the event code GIH. Next, select the Q&A tab on the top of the screen and submit your questions. It takes a few seconds and it makes uh, the webinar so much more interesting hearing your questions. With us today, we have two tax and VAT experts. I would like to welcome, first of all, Martijn Jagers, Head of Indirect Tax Practice at Tax and Netherlands and Richard Meerstra, tax lawyer at TechCent Netherlands. Martijn and Richard, how are you? Doing fine. Uh, thank you, uh, Willem. Very happy to be here. That's good. That's good. Welcome, Richard, uh, as well. And thank you very much for being here, taking the time for the preparation and for this time in the webinar. Uh, Martijn, let's start by looking at the specific VAT rules and regulations that are relevant to licensed gambling operators. Could you please explain the VAT treatment of licensed online betting and gambling activities in the Netherlands? Um, sure, Willem. Um, as you already mentioned uh, during the uh, intro, the VAT exemption um, is one of the elements that are that are key here. If you look at online lottery and gambling activities, these are, from a VAT perspective, uh, considered an electronic services, uh, electronic service for VAT uh, purposes. And as a result, this means that uh, VAT could become due. Uh, at the place where the customer, the player, in fact, resides. So for a player that resides in the Netherlands, Dutch VAT could become due. And I should repeat could here because it does not mean that the services are actually going to be subject to VAT. Now, whether VAT um, um, actually becomes, becomes due upon the revenue depends on uh, actually uh, a link between the Dutch VAT Act, uh, VAT Act and the Dutch Gambling uh, Gambling Tax uh, Act, and what we will see in a minute is that most of the um, uh, most of the gambling act, lottery and gambling activities are in fact uh, exempt from VAT. Um, what the Dutch VAT Act does, in line with in fact the governing EU VAT directive is 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 um, uh, providing authority to the to the to the Dutch tax Dutch Ministry of Finance in fact to decide which games are and which games uh, are not going to be subject to VAT and what the Dutch legislator has chosen for is to directly link in full to the definition of games of chance within the uh, gambling tax act so the result is that whatever is going to be uh, subject to the um, is going to be defined as a game of chance within the gambling tax act is going to be exempt from VAT and if the VAT exemption uh, means that VAT cannot become due upon the player or the, or the organizer um, that then basically brings the question what is then uh, considered to be a game of chance how is that defined in the Netherlands um, uh, I, and perhaps, perhaps most of the viewers already know, but what, what the Dutch Gambling Tax Act in that says that um, um, all games that include an element of chance, 
that cannot be predominantly, predominantly sorry, influenced by the player uh, is going to be considered a game of chance. And once it's a game of chance, it's not going to be subject to VAT. And for that purpose, it doesn't actually even matter whether the operator is going to be licensed or not for VAT purposes. That's an irrelevant fact. Um, also interesting to know that well, the, the, there are occasions whereby a player uh, can, in fact, particularly looking at that player, perhaps um, predominantly influence uh, the game. For example, uh, for algorithm-based plays or certain professional players, that does not in itself mean that all of a sudden the Gambling Tax Act is no longer valid and that VAT becomes due. Uh, we have to view that from a Dutch perspective in a sort of an overall base. So if overall speaking, um, the game cannot be, be uh, influenced looking at the entire batch of players, uh, if you will, it's still going to be considered a game of chance. So what are then considered games of chance um, in the Netherlands as a, as a few examples? Well, what have you, you have um, the online casino, the roulette, the baccarat, poker rooms, blackjack, uh, online slot machines, bingo, sports betting and lotteries. Um, but for example, not bridge, as that is considered a skill-based game and is considered to be sufficiently uh, influenced by that players. So that one is going to be subject to VAT. Um, let me see if I adequately answered your question. Um, so yeah, well, basically the online betting and gambling activities that will be uh, subject to the uh, to the license uh, per later this year. I think it's fair to say that that most of those are going to be a, a VAT exempt. Yeah, great. Uh, good kickoff of the webinar, um, Martijn. Thank you very much. Moving on to Richard, Richard Meerstra. Welcome, Richard. How are you? How is uh, how's life? Thank you. I'm doing well. That's good. That's good, Richard. Welcome, and also thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Following on the previous question to Martijn, could you explain what the main consequences are of the VAT exemption for companies providing online betting and gambling activities? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, well, the most obvious consequence, um, of course, would be that the company that uh, provides online betting services, and as those betting services or betting or gambling activities are VAT exempt, it does not have to remit any VAT on the revenues that it generates. So if we assume that consumers, players, are generally willing to pay a set price, regardless whether that price includes or excludes VAT, then the exemption will actually benefit the margin of the gaming company. Um, I think this is best to illustrate with a, a, a quick and um, I think easy example. Um, let's say that a, a certain game uh, that a player is willing to pay um, around uh, 10 euros to play a game. That the price that the, that the player is willing to pay is not affected by the VAT. Um, so it will pay 10 euros with or without VAT. So the gaming company can always only charge that set price. Otherwise, the, the player will go to a different website that's maybe a bit cheaper. So if the, if the exemption applies on that uh, specific game, then the net revenue of the gaming company will be, of course, that 10 euros. However, if the exemption does not apply, then the gaming company has to pay VAT from the 10 euros of revenue, which is then considered already to include VAT. So if we calculate with the Dutch VAT rate of 21%, if we take that out of the 10 euros revenues, and we get a net revenue of about eight euros and, and 30 cents. So the VAT exemption actually benefits the revenue side margin with around 17%. Uh, downside of the VAT, VAT exemption, however, is, and I think you also already pointed it out in your introduction a bit, that the company that offers VAT exempt gaming activities or actually any VAT exempt activities is not allowed to reclaim input VAT on costs that can be linked to the VAT exempt activity. So a gaming company having a marketing costs, of course, for affiliate marketing, and that charge VAT to the company. Um, and if then those activities are used for the VAT exempt gambling, 
then the VAT charged by the um, by the affiliate company, by the marketing company, cannot be recovered, and that means that the VAT will be a cost for the gaming company. So that actually hurts the margin because the costs increase. Generally, if you are in a, a profit-making company in a profit-making setting, then the upside of not having to pay, pay VAT on your revenues will, of course, be higher than the downside on not having VAT or not having VAT recovery on your costs. So, in the end, it, it should be a, a favorable position, but we do always have to take into account that for gambling activities, if also, as, as uh, Martijn just told, if the, um, the activity is VAT exempt, then it's linked to the gambling taxes, and then gambling tax is levied on the winnings. So, it's not completely true that the, um, if it's VAT exempt, that the margin then, of course, increases by the full 70%. We also have to take into account that there is a downside on the gambling tax um, that we also have to keep in mind if you calculate what is more beneficial or better for the gaming company. I okay. think that are the most, um, or the main consequences of the VAT exemption for these type of companies. Okay, that's quite insightful. And thank you, uh, Richard. Before we move to the next question, I would like to re remind you at home that you can submit your questions still to our speakers through the Slido app or website. So whatever you hear during the webinar now, if you have any questions, look at Slido, select the Q&A tab on the top of the screen and submit your question. Or if you see questions from others that you like, you can upvote them and then we know they're more popular and we'll uh, high, higher prioritize these uh, questions. Returning to Martijn here. Um, Martijn, will the VAT exemption for license operates also impact affiliates and other providers of marketing services? Oh, yes, I think so. I think that 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 affiliate marketeers um, and, and, and marketing providers in general, um, they should be aware that the gaming operators that are going to be procuring their services um, aren't able basically to recover VAT uh, incurred on their services and and what you what you what you often see in the VAT exempt market in general is that at the time uh, invoices invoices are going to be raised for marketing services rendered and 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 and, and then uh, all of a sudden everybody realizes that the services are going to be subject to VAT so VAT is basically going to be charged in addition um, there's going to be pushback uh, on who's going to be paying the element of VAT that nobody uh, expected on the receiving side. So affiliate marketeers should especially uh, be um, be looking into the contracts that they already have in place or the contracts that they will be closing um, closing with uh, with uh, these operators uh, in due course to make sure that 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 any VAT that is going to be uh, becoming due can in fact be charged in addition where appropriate to these um, to these uh, operators if you are in a situation within the netherlands so you have a dutch marketeer um, selling its services to a to a, a a dutch recipient it's a simple case and dutch vat is going to be charged uh, on the service fee invoice but if the operator is established uh, outside the netherlands the invoice that the marketeer service of uh, the marketing service provider is going to be issuing is going to be without VAT, and the uh, the operator, upon receipt of that invoice, needs to realize that he may have a liability to self account for VAT due on those services. So, for example, if he uh, receives a service charge for a value of uh, 100 euros without Dutch uh, VAT. Uh, he may um, be uh, required to self-account, depending on the country he's established in within the EU, to additionally account for 15 or 27 euros for which he may not be having a right to recover. So the cost increase can be can be quite significant, um, especially if not ex if not uh, uh, expected. But what what the the contracts. Uh, look, in looking at the, at the contracts, the marketing services providers should really um, be clear on the fact that whatever fee they agree to is a fee that's going to be exclusive of VAT and that VAT can always be charged in addition to the service fee when appropriate or, or when required by law, basically. Um, 
Additional point I think that is relevant to mention here is that in view of the tax authorities, um, a, an invoice should follow a contract. So if you have a contract for marketing services between uh, Dutch residents, um, then the expectation of the authorities would be that the invoice for the marketing services should also be attracting 21% uh, Dutch uh, VAT. Um, what, ha what happens um, on occasion is that at the time the invoice is raised, um, the invoice recipient says, oh, hmm, this is not entirely convenient for me. Please, can I ask you, Mr. Service Provider, to raise your invoice, not to me, but to my parent company, say in Malta, or perhaps still in uh, Gibraltar. Um, what then happens is that the service contract remains in place uh, often and that the, uh, the the service charge is going to be made without Dutch uh, VAT because it's all of a sudden issued to Malta. If at that point the tax authorities come do an audit uh, at the, um, at the uh, marketing services uh, company and they consider that you have a contract between two Dutch entities um, whereas, in fact, the invoice has been raised outside of the Netherlands without VAT. Rest assured that the Dutch tax authorities will be assessing Dutch VAT in addition, potentially increased with a penalty and late payment uh, interest from their services provider. So always be sure that your invoices tie in with your contracts in terms of place of establishment. Um, then I think the final, the final point to mention here is that um, the, 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 the marketing services provider should also be, be clear on the fact that they should always know who it is that they are servicing. For example, if, if their, their client says to them, hey, I'm established uh, outside the Netherlands, whereas he is in fact established inside the Netherlands, the marketing services provider might be raising his invoice without Dutch VAT wrongly. So always be sure that you have uh, on the marketing service provider level your files in order that you can actually document that uh, your client is actually established where he says he is established and also um, be very wary of the situations that you are for example in close contact for all the service provisions with somebody outside the Netherlands um, sorry, with somebody inside the Netherlands, but are in fact invoicing to a company outside the Netherlands. So always be, try to have as much clarity as you can that your client um, is established actually outside the Netherlands if you are invoicing without VAT. Because the one basic rule that we have in EU VAT uh, is in fact that invoices for services rendered can only be raised without VAT if you have sufficient proof in your files that you are correctly doing so. I think that's, that should be considered a warning as well. Yeah. Oh, Martijn, these are very um, good practical recommendations here. Um, for those who are looking at home and it's going a bit too fast, again, there will be a webinar report tomorrow and the video will be online. And you can see word by word what Martijn has been saying there. And thank you again, Martijn. Moving to the next question, also for you, Martijn. Dutch VAT exemption for gambling products and services could, could as you also uh, indicated, have a severely negative impact on locally licensed operators. In that case, what are the available solutions to prevent these negative VAT effects? Yeah, there, there, there are some 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 solutions uh, that can be applied, and it depends, I think, um, between the situation that you are as an organization in. For example, if there is a reason that the marketing service provider has to be directly contracting with the actual gambling operator, there's there's not so much room to to maneuver, I would say. And it's really dependent on the VAT legislation applicable in the country where the operator is established, whether part of the VAT can be recovered. Then again, if you have some flexibility to, um, to let's say, um, um, improve your, your, your VAT structure a bit, and, and you could, for example, also um, uh, um, be able to uh, introduce an additional group company into the structure, 
that you could use specifically for the procurement from uh, the procurement of marketing services from um, from third uh, parties, then you have an option to reduce your uh, your VAT burden. One of the things that you can look at is that um, let's say if you if you incorporate an additional marketing services uh, company, you have that company uh, contract with the um, external marketing services uh, provider, and that company then subsequently contracts with the um, with the business that provides the uh, the gambling slash lottery activities. It's quite relevant what you do with that particular contract in terms of is VAT going to be due on that or not? Um, and if so, on what value? There are some things that you can look at. Um, one of the elements is that you try to break the link between, um, between the, the service and the actual remuneration for that. And the interesting thing in VAT law is if you have no direct link then basically uh, VAT should not become due. Um, and it would be best to combine um, such approach with a situation, uh, for example, of a revenue share or something that is really variable uh, through which you um, uh, substantiate that what it is that you do between the marketing services company and the gambling operating company is not entirely to be considered as a supply for VAT purposes that is going to be taxable. I think those are the things that you can play with, but bear in mind that uh, in view of the tax authorities, and not only in the Netherlands, but of course throughout the EU, the perception is that marketing uh, services are taxable and that if provided to a gambling operator, in principle, VAT recovery should not be allowed. So if you try to upgrade your structure to a situation whereby you are reducing your VAT burden. In fact, I think it's fair to assume that at one point in time, this is going to uh, increase the interest of the local uh, tax authorities. So, so, so bear in mind that the structure, if implemented, should also be possible uh, to be adequately maintained, um, as with all VAT saving uh, structures. And that is one of the key points that always goes wrong implementation uh, generally goes fine and then maintenance after the first six months first 12 months uh, works fine as well and then after that um, it slides a little bit and that's where your risk is so um, um, yeah those are the things that i think uh, you should be looking at in order to be reducing the vat burden on those services Great. Uh, really, really interesting, and I appreciate you telling it to us as in a very accessible uh, way. Um, final question for Richard. Uh, Richard, let's go back to Richard. As we heard, the use of foreign subsidiaries can lessen the impact of the Dutch VAT regime, uh, Richard. Are there any specific considerations for companies that generally only operate in other countries than the Netherlands? Um, yeah, there are, and um, I would like to discuss two topics in that regard. Uh, first one is on the invoicing side, supplier invoices received by the uh, non-Dutch gaming company. And the second one is the output side, is the qualification of the, of the servers that they are performing. Um, to start with the, with the supplier side, um, well, most companies, at least I can imagine that most companies that are operating in a certain a certain country, that they are used to working with suppliers from that country, or at least not with suppliers from the Netherlands. Um, they are most likely then used to receiving invoices with maybe local VAT or maybe reverse charge VAT. Um, we can understand that a, um, a company, a non-Dutch company entering the Dutch gaming market will also acquire services from Dutch companies, for example, from a Dutch marketing uh, service company that's targeting the Dutch market. Um, those invoices received should in, uh, well, almost never should include Dutch VAT. Because as Martijn also just told, uh, B2B invoices should generally reverse charge to the, uh, to the client, in this case, the gaming company. So the Dutch company providing marketing services to the non-Dutch gaming company should always reverse charge VAT on its invoices and never include Dutch VAT. Um, if it does include Dutch VAT, and in practice we see this, this going warm, well, 
quite often, um, if it does include VAT, then that, then that VAT cannot be recovered. Even if there is a right to recover VAT, it cannot be recovered. The authorities will not refund this. Um, so that will in any case become a cost. So if you receive such invoice, you should always, as a gaming company that's not established in the Netherlands, receiving an invoice from a Dutch company with Dutch VAT, you should always request another invoice, reject that invoice, otherwise you'll pay Dutch VAT, and also we have to self-assess local VAT in your own country, depending on the rules there. Um, so you could have a double VAT burden, and, and of course that's something you would like to avoid. Um, this is a bit different than in some other EU countries. For example, in, uh, in Austria, they have a, um, well, a, a, a type of service or a type of VAT regime that's called the use and enjoyment principle. Um, if that principle is applied, certain services, for example, a service relating to a website or a market, local marketing service, can correctly be subject to local VAT. So a non-Dutch company can be used to receiving log invoices with local VAT from such companies, but keep in mind that it's almost never correct if that is invoiced by a Dutch company. So other, other countries have different rules, but in the Netherlands, it should be with reverse charge VAT almost always. And the next one that relates to the, uh, to the output side, so to the, actually the games offered by the, uh, by the gaming company. As we just discussed in the beginning of this webinar, the VAT exemption is linked to the Dutch Gambling Taxes Act. Um, it should be reviewed by a gaming company per type of game, how these games are treated in the Netherlands for the Gaming Taxes Act. And then of course, how this relates to the VAT exemption. If certain games, as I think Martijn told earlier, like a bridging game is not VAT exempt, it's not an, uh, a gaming, a gambling taxes game, then the VAT exemption does not apply. So then the company will have to remit Dutch VAT. Um, it will then have to uh, report Dutch VAT, most likely via the European so-called one-stop shop system. This does require a registration and also, of course, does require that VAT is actually paid. Um, so it's very important to keep in mind that not all gambling, that all betting games fall under the exemption. And there can also be certain types of games that should be VAT taxed and that, of course, should be reported. And I think the best advice would be for a gaming company is to uh, review that their type of game and keep on monitoring this because the laws are of course are of course always evolving and changing and, and subject to amendments. So it should be reviewed on a regular basis going forward. Great. Uh, thank you, Richard. There was a lot of information in the last uh, uh, answer there, and I think it has given our viewers something to to think about here. So don't go away. Before we move on the audience Q&A, a final and quick reminder to, to you at home here that you can submit your questions to our, spe and to our speakers through the Slido app or the website. So again, please scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or go to slido.com and uh, use the uh, hashtag GIH. And let's see, Martijn is back here at the first audience questions. Looking at our editor here, and we have a question from Rijn Hoefnagels. Is there, an, is there an NL regulation similar to the Malta whitelist, i.e. applying the VAT exemption to, purchase, to purchases that are strictly required for supplying gaming services? Um, looking at Martijn and uh, you, Richard, is that something um, you have vision on? Um, the, 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 the Malta regulation, um, let's say it's completely different, uh, different from what we have uh, in the Netherlands on that part. So, so we don't have, um, we don't have, uh, we don't apply a VAT exemption uh, on, 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 well, in the example that we discussed, marketing and services. Those are going to be taxable um, if purchased by a Dutch established operator. Okay, anything to add to Richard? Um, no, okay. nothing to add, but I think that the short answer would be, no, we do not have such a whitelist. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. 
Uh, moving on to the second question. I believe we have four good questions here. What rules are applicable regarding place of supply slash supply slash place of consumption? Who is seen as the consumer, player, operator when it comes to third party services? Um, well, let's say the when it comes to third party services. Um, interesting well let's say that could be interpreted what that what that exactly means um the if the 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 operator is going to be uh, the one that is legally uh, legally contracting that's going to be uh, the one consuming the service that's going to be considered the recipient uh, of the service if you have the, the, the possibility within the site for a player to directly contract uh, with with another party within the platform uh, so to say that could be considered a direct relation and a direct provision of a service. So it depends a little bit on where you want to go to with this question. Okay. And in a situation that you have a, a, a um, that, that you have that you have a direct contract between um, the service provider uh, and and the operator, that's then for the place of supply purposes going to be viewed based on the merits of that service likely it's going to be a, a general b2b service subject to the place of supply where the operator is established um, if it's a direct supply to the uh, to the consumer by the third party to the player by the third party service uh, provider um, that's likely going to be uh, an ordinary b2c supply taxable where the player is uh, is is residing yeah um, and not and not therefore taxable uh, at operator level yeah thank you martijn thank you martijn let's go to the next question uh, here um we have another question here what kind of operational costs and which conditions can be shifted to a foreign group entity and which which can't uh, can you generally say something about that martijn or richard that's a question which has a lot in, a lot in it it goes into the i think to the um to the situation that i discussed the vat saving scheme um well let's say this also ties into corporate income tax um which is not not entirely my or richard's uh, specialism there are let's say costs that always belong to the entity itself, which you, uh, which you cannot um, shift or recharge uh, to a different level. Um, I think that the costs that we were referring to specifically regard marketing and costs that could fall into a similar kind of, a similar kind of bucket. For example, um, uh, tax advisory or, or, or certain licensing uh, costs those type of costs, but this would okay. this would be really um, in terms of the in terms of any uh, uh, advice something you would like to qualify on a specific cost basis. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Martijn. I believe there's one more question. So with that question, we can wrap up the webinar. Uh, what supranational VAT legislation may be applic applicable, in particular for multinational operators? That's something uh, you both discussed briefly during your last answer. Um, yeah, well, um, for multinational operators. To go into that a bit, what you have is um, you, you have the EU VAT directive, which lays down a framework uh, for all uh, EU VAT countries and the EU uh, countries are required to uh, transpose that legislation, the, the directive into their own local laws. Um, so each local EU VAT law is in fact a local implementation of that same EU VAT directive. And what we have seen then um, over recent years is a lot of court litigation on the EU level on trying to to reach a more common common ground on what specific wording means within the directive because in country a it's in it's interpreted uh, like such and so which is a little bit different in country b 
and, and it should be a harmonized interpretation. So another part of supranational legislation in place uh, is the EU VET regulation. And that regu VET regulation um, helps coming to a, a, a common interpretation of that EU VAT directive. So you have a directive on one point um, and a regulation on the directive as a second one. And then there are, let's say, um, there are more directives uh, that relate to the to the to the EAT, EU VAT directive, but those two are the most important ones. And multinational operators, yeah. okay. um, uh, they 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 have therefore the VAT directive and the regulation as their as their common playbook basically, um, but they should really really re realize that those rules. Um, especially the rules under the EU VAT directive, when transposed to local legislation, may be interpreted differently in uh, one member state to the other, and especially in terms of um, in terms of what is and what is not a VAT exempt for games, uh, that can be different. That can really be different from one country to yeah. the other. So what is exempt from VAT in the yeah. Netherlands can in fact be taxable in Germany. Yeah, I understand that, Martijn. And um, thank you for answering this fourth and uh, last question. Thank you for your participation here today, Martijn. Thank you, Richard, for joining us today. I would also like to extend our gratitude to Frans Duinstee, the colleague that helped us uh, setting this all up. Uh, and with this, we have come to the end of this Gaming in Holland webinar. I hope you found it useful. A link to the full recording of today's webinar will be shared in the post-webinar mailer tomorrow that you'll receive as part of the Gaming in Holland newsletter. As always, let's keep in touch. If you have not signed up for free newsletters and print magazines, please do so at www.gamingin.eu. Uh, you can pick the countries there, Germany, Holland, and Spain, and receive your newsletters on a regular basis. Let's stay in touch. I hope to see you again soon and have a fantastic day. Thank you.